Welcome to the Command Post Podcast, powered by First Do. I'm your host, Tom Lewis, First Do's Enterprise Training Manager. I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Ben May to this episode of our podcast. Ben is currently a board director for the Center for Public Safety Excellence, CPSE. He is a recently retired director of Global Corporate Alliances for a company we're all familiar with, the Walt Disney Company. Ben has also served as a firefighter in Hillendale, Maryland, as well as a fire commissioner in Washington State with the Woodenville Fire and Rescue Department. Ben was a contributing editor for Firehouse Magazine for 15 years, a consultant to both the United States Fire Administration and the Oklahoma State University School of Fire Protection Technology. He is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Oklahoma University with a Master's of Arts in International Communication from American University. Impressive credentials indeed. He is also one of the nicest people I've met on my life's journey. Hey, Ben, it's so great to have you here on our podcast today and to reconnect with you. Uh, and I think let's just let's get right to it. I want I want to ask you about how you talk and write about the fire service being America's most trusted brand. You know a little bit about branding. You, you spent quite a bit of time at what is arguably one of the best known brands in the world, the most recognized one of the most recognized brands in the world, and that's the Walt Disney Company and all of its um, media that it puts out to the world. But there's one thing to be the most recognized, but then there's another to be the most trusted. Mm -hmm. And with so many entities, whether they're government, corporations, kind of betraying the trust of citizens and customers out there, it seems that the fire service is enduring um, as a trusted brand. But why is that? Why, why do you think that one, it is America's most trusted brand and why it matters today? Thank you very much for having me, Tom. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Um, great question. And uh, so let me kind of see what I can do to give you an answer. Um, when I started to write for Firehouse, <clears throat> I don't necessarily know that I use the term branding to tell you the truth. Um, I started, uh, before I worked for the Walt Disney Company. When I be began to work for Disney, the idea of the brand became prominent. Um, I remember early in my uh, education with Disney, the brand was always the number one thing and we didn't want to ever do anything to uh, put the brand in jeopardy. And then I learned, well, what is it? What, what creates a brand? What's it all about? What are the very, uh, very various indicators? And the first thing that came to mind is trust. And the idea, first of all, to answer the first question, the idea behind the fire department being one of trust reminds me of a uh, poll that was taken by a Pew Charitable Trust in the, I think it was in the 90s. And they said, who do you trust the most? And it had, uh, you know, various entities, schools, uh, politicians weren't in there, but other kinds of things that had to do with your, with your family or your, your uh, organization or what you did day to day. And the fire service, the fire department was trusted second only to one's immediate family. That is very high. And what I mean by that is we feel safe when we see the fire department coming. Um, when I was a little kid, I grew up in a chaotic atmosphere. Um, I was an only child. My parents fought a lot. And the only place that I felt safe was at the firehouse. And I would, I would go down there, I'd walk into the main fire station on California Avenue in Oklahoma City, and my eyes would get as big as saucers. And those men would look at me like I was the most important kid in the world. And that was it. And I, just, I felt safe. And I think people feel safe with us. They feel safe. Um, we're the only one of the only organizations that can be invited into into the citizens home and they don't really ask a lot of questions. It's because we take that oath. So that's the first piece. And then I as I studied more about the history of the fire service, I, I came to the conclusion that the fire service protects our citizens first right in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We protect the first right so they can enjoy the second too. Mm. And that's a sacred oath. And it's, it's an honor. And so when I began to think about, well, how does that relate from a branding perspective, once I got to Disney, 
it means it's, it's a way of showing people very quickly what we're about. The average American today receives approximately 10,000 commercial messages a day. That's according to the American Advertising Association. The ability to react to those is about the bandwidth of 100 if you're lucky. Now, if you take the iPhone or the mobile device, whichever one you may use, mm -hmm. and you add that, the um, uh, average at attention span of an American is that of a nap. They, they, that's why stories are, you know, you've heard of the term um, uh, flash fiction now. So in other words, people now are reading stories that are like, you know, 200 words or something because their attention span is so short. Well, a brand is something you pick up real quick. Now, if you take a look at the history of the Maltese cross, just as a brand and it's available, it's, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's everywhere in our, in our psyche. I happened to be in a, I was with my wife and we were looking for clothes for our, grand, our grandchildren. And I can't remember the name of one of those stores in the mall there. And I, I went to look at the, you know, at the, uh, you know, the little um, uh, pajamas. Well, there might have been 10 of those pajamas and four of them had fire engines on them. Now you think <laughs> about that. And one of them was actually looked like a little mini turnout coat, right? Oh, so, so it's like Brunacini used to say, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, they put it, it's in our brains from a very young age. And so that's a great thing. What the, 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 the challenge is, so how do we protect that brand? And the way we protect it is what we do every day and who we are. So, so Ben, that's, uh, your, your, use of, your use of the term brand has is is always been interesting to me, right? When, when we collaborated previously, it would be easy to say profession, organization, government service. Why is the word brand such a powerful term? And I, I, I say that because I'm I'm interested. I think I probably majored in marketing in another lifetime because it fascinates me so much, the psychology of it. But that use, I think that was very intentional, your use of the word brand, and as opposed to any other term that would define an organization, right, or define um, a body, right? So you, we don't hear like the army necessarily as a brand or the clergy as a brand, but you, you do that with the fire service. Tell, tell me a little bit why. Okay. First of all, the army is a brand. The clergy is a brand. Right. And, and I'm not, this isn't marketing mumbo jumbo stuff, a, a, a marketing jargon. I don't mean it that way at all. Right. If right. You, it, if you dig into what a brand is all about, it has equity, brand equity. I call it reputation equity. Mm. If you look at a PL from any organization, uh, if you talk about a commercial organization in particular, you'll see a line that says goodwill. And the goodwill, the, the goodwill piece is millions of dollars, millions in a company. And so you may wonder, goodwill, that's kind of a soft, squishy kind of a thing, goodwill. It's everything because it's what the consumer, if it happens to be that kind of an organization, thinks about the brand. So it's what causes them to go buy whatever it is because they trust whatever it is. Okay. Now, take a, you start to think about you have uh, approximately 50,000 fire stations from 20,000 fire departments in the United States. Each of those 50,000 stations is in a neighborhood. And that means that the citizens' proximity to that brand is very small, very short. Uh, it's a very short walk. Okay? okay. We're pervasive. We are pervasive. So if we're going to survive, if we're going to survive, we have to make sure that we take care of our brand because the brand is the way to telegraph to whoever it is we serve what we're all about in one picture. And if you go back to what I said about the attention span of a gnat, that's exactly all you're going to get is that one thing. And then if you start to strap onto that, all the things that the fire service represents, it's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. OK, and, it, and it's based on the origins of our country. And you can go back further than that, but it's based on who we are as a country. Now, every country has obviously different folkways in history of, of the fire service. If you take a look at uh, if you look at um, Japan or if you look at France, like the France, it's the military. They're, they're a military entity. If you look at Japan, theirs is mostly um, they're kind of a society that. Uh, 
does exactly what they're told to do many times, not always, but sure, they're conformists. Sure. They're conformists. So if you have a fire in Japan, you've heard this, you know, they go, oh, Mrs. Nakamura, you know, you left the iron on. How could you do that? Boo, you know. So if you have it here, we give you blankets and we say, poor thing, you know, and we give cookies to the firefighters with them at a good stop or a bad stop. Don't make any difference. They just love who we are. That's not going to cut it for the future. For the future, we have, we have to grow our brand to become more pervasive. I'm kind of getting ahead of maybe where you want to go on this. No, no, no. You're, you're spot on. This is a perfect segue because... So, go ahead. so if you start to think about things like, as we talked about community risk reduction, the brand becomes more pervasive because, in fact, what are we responsible for? Fire and life safety, 360 degree. If you get a hangnail, you call me and I will be there. You have a problem, you call me. I'm going to be there. I remember one time I was on a call. I used to go out at night uh, in Phoenix and Brunacini sent me out <laughs> on calls. And we went to one where um, a young guy was, di- he was in a diabetic stupor. And so we packaged him up and we got him ready to go. And his mother was there and she was distraught and she was crying. And there was this big <laughs> captain on the engine company. And, she, and she, she looked at him and she said, could I just get a hug from you? Hmm. And he goes, sure. And I mean, that was like, I looked at that yeah. and I went, oh my goodness, it doesn't get better than this. I mean, that's what it's about. It's not just put the fire out. No. Do, we already know how to do that stuff. That's what, that's how we roll. I mean, I remember, I mean, there were, it brought a lot of joy to me on the job when, I mean, we have a, someone who has a medical emergency at say the Walmart, right? They got groceries. They have to go to the hospital. They're going to be worried about their groceries, maybe their pet back at the house. They give us their car keys. We take their groceries back, put it in the refrigerator, lock up their house, make sure yeah. their dog's fed. And that brought a lot of satisfaction because yeah, we love the action, you know, the putting out the fires, cutting up the cars, rescuing people, but man, the impact you make on those little, little uh, gestures of kindness. I think that's part, I think we're, you know, you're explaining how, how and why we're America's most trusted brand. And, and so you're, you were, you started to go down the path because it's a perfect segue, um, especially since this is the first new command pose podcast is what da- what role is data going to be playing or is playing in ensuring that we remain America's most trusted brand? Well, I'm glad you asked me. Um, <laughs> so so um, the data, you know, it's so interesting. When I was fire commissioner, <laughs> it was very difficult to get the guys, guys at the time to put in the data for infers because they just didn't want to do it. You mm-hmm. know, I don't want to do that, you know. And boy, have times changed. And so if you, it used to be, I used to say, if you like being a firefighter, you'd better understand what marketing and branding is all about, or you won't be in business. Well, now it's, if you like being a firefighter, you better embrace data or you won't be in business. And that's a fact. If you can't prove what you're doing uh, to the city, to the, not just the citizens, but to the government, fathers and mothers, local government, city managers, you won't be in business either. And it's actually a major opportunity with data. So some of the things for me anyway, that data is used for is critical is when we're doing, being with uh, Center for um, Excellence, uh, doing a strategic planning. So we don't do a strategic, if you're accredited and you don't, you've got to do a strategic plan. Most of our departments do anyway, whether they're accredited or not. So what do you, what goes in a strategic plan is, the way the neighborhoods laid out, thanks to you know to the uh, computer now and the ability to get into that data, we can pinpoint where you know where problems were. It used to be and say, well, what are the hazard areas before we were big into data? Say, well, what are the hazard areas we need to look out for? Well, we got an oil refinery over here. We got blah blah blah. Now we can zero down and find you know get it very fine to find out where some of the major problems are. So the data itself helps us. Uh, complete the mission. But the other part of it is it helps us explain why we need to be doing what we're doing. It helps us to not do certain things we shouldn't be doing. So we we become more uh, relevant. We become more valuable. Um, and it's not by mistake, or I should say mistake. It, it's um, the Center for Excellence in Public Safety. There's a reason why that name has its name. Uh, it has to do with our mutual friend, Randy Brugman, who is one, yes, of, the, one of the founders. 
And let's talk about marketing genius. He is one. And so um, the idea was we're not just going to do fire. We're going to do everything that that has to do with the safety of the citizen. We haven't quite got to the police yet, but give us time. We might. <laughs> Maybe we won't. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is that's where community risk reduction starts to come in. So it's not just it's now it's not fire and EMS. To me, the brand is fire and life safety. And that's what we actually named our department in Woodenville, fire and life safety, mm -hmm. everything. Now, from a marketing perspective, that's a big deal, because if you're in marketing, you want to own the whole damn, you want to own the whole market, right? We don't segment our markets. You know, we give the same quality of service to a guy living under a bridge as we do somebody living in a swank, you know, house <laughs> somewhere. It's the same quality of service. Yeah. So the main thing with us is now, we can do lots of different things. If you take a look at Mesa, Arizona, I was, thinking, I was just thinking they changed their a, name. Rio Rico down in Southern Arizona, they changed their name to reflect, a, a perfect, the mission, to, to reflect exactly. the mission. It's a perfect example, but it's, it's a, if, if you go back to the seventies, remember, remember before we got into EMS and it was all just fire. Sure. And then we just, well, and then yeah. we, Oh my God, we got into EMS and then it became, you know, uh, you know, uh, EM, uh, fire and EMS, right? We, we, we're like a public safety distribution system. That's really what we are. And so you can keep adding stuff onto that system, which people do. We may break someday. But I mean, the point is, is that we keep expanding this mission, which means that our brand becomes more pervasive. So if you take the fact that people pretty much trust us, right, and then you had the pervasiveness of it, that's all good, but that's really not going to be enough for the future. For the future, we're going to have to understand how we dispatch in a better way. We're going to have to change uh, what we call rules of cover. They're going to have to be in a different way. Do we bring in a robot to put out a, you know, all hands instead of bringing in guys and girls to go do it when they really don't need to? And so what that means back to the rookie firefighter is, is, is like, you know, he's, I've heard the term, well, I didn't sign on for this. You know, I didn't mm. sign on for this. You know, I want to put the wet stuff on the red stuff and da 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 da. And you say, well, we only have, uh, you know, seven, four uh, percent of what we do is putting out fires. And, you know, the fire problem's over. Two, you haven't asked me the question, but I'll give you two answers. The first <laughs> is, the first is, we do have a fire problem. Anyone that tells you we don't have a fire problem, go to Europe sometime and take a look or Japan. Sure. We have a fire problem. How do I know? Turn on your TV tonight or tomorrow night or maybe a couple of nights from now and see what's on there. They're probably going to be a house fire. Not guaranteed. Depends on where you live. But more than likely, you're going to get a house fire or some kind of a fire. That's not normal in other countries. It's not normal. It's not normal in the UK. It's I mean, unless they have one of these big conflagrations, which they had in that big tower. It's not very normal, but here we have them just like, boom. so we still have a fire. It's much better, much, much, sure, much better. Sure. Yeah. So I, I mean, going with what you're saying, when people ask me about joining the fire service, I said, if you don't love EMS and you don't love dealing with people, um, you're going to be disappointed because you do that more than you do what I call the fun stuff, right? P putting on your turnouts and SCB and going interior or, you know, cutting up a vehicle because someone's trapped. Those yeah. don't happen. I mean, in mo most parts of the country, they don't happen as frequently. And again, we don't want tragedy to befall anybody, but we certainly want to be there to help. And they don't occur as much. And so we're, we're serving, we have to come in with a servant leadership, servant mindset. Um, and, you know, data, what you're, what you're talking about that all hazards and the community risk reduction component, um, the decision makers, those that control bar strings, whether it's city council members, whether it's a commission board of commissioners, whether it's a fire district board, they are becoming more and more savvy. It's not, we love you fire department and here's keys to the you know, shiny red truck, which I know they don't come with keys, but here's, you know, here's your shiny new red truck. No, it's tell us why, show us why you need this staffing, show us why you need this apparatus. And it feels like and I think the facts are there, not just the feelings that it's data that's going to tell that story. Right. So that will help continue us as, a, as being able to serve at the high level as America's most trusted brand. Right. No question about it. And and you and and where the future lies. So if you like going back to our two, two things, I'll say on this. 
One is you go back to these young firefighters and, you know, and they've got to understand, I've got the uniform, I've got the, I got the badge, I got through all those tests, I am trust trusted servant, you know, of the public. It doesn't matter what I do. I mean, what I mean by that is within my area of protection. In other words, whether it's EMS, whether it's giving a woman a hug, I mean, because she, not a, you know, I'm saying if she needs it or some, or helping <laughs> kids, or helping people or whatever it might be, that's your job. That's your job. I don't want to hear what you don't want to do. This is your job. It means you protect the public. There's no more noble job. You don't need to be, you don't need to be, you know, uh, cutting cars and stuff. Yeah, that's great. That comes up. You train for that. No question about it. Sure. Your job is to protect the public 24 seven. That's big enough. You just figure out how you're going to make your contribution to do it and you'll be just fine. You know? So, so let's come back a little bit that that's, I mean, terrific, but let, let, let's come back to data just a little bit. Do you, okay. can you, in, in your experience, um, both, you know, serving as a firefighter, serving as a, as a commissioner, and then now on the, the, the board for, for CPSC, mm -hmm. do you have, you know, one or two examples, you know, maybe a great example and one where there was lacking of data where data um, helped a department when they needed it or hurt a department because they didn't have it? Mm. Well, I can tell you uh, one department that has it and does it very well, and that's Spokane Valley, mm. uh, Washington mm. State. And I wrote an article about those, those folks because they are able to take a an actual um, they they have a dashboard, and that dashboard is always available to the public. And on the dashboard is the fact that they're accredited, how many calls, etc. It's like an annual report, but it's it's like up to the minute. And the data shows what not just what they've done, but where certain hazards are, what to keep out, you know, the whole everything. And I asked, and I asked the woman who um, who's responsible for that, who happens to be a real marketing professional. That's another thing that's happening now. More and more people are coming into the to the fire service that have this kind of background, whether they not necessarily firefighting background, but one in marketing. And she was able to, and I and I said to her, I said, "This all this data is great, and you've shown this, and it makes sense." And she goes. And I said, I love this template, you know, that you put together. And she said, um, well, that's not what I really use. I mean, people can look at that. What I use is a picture of a neighborhood, a quiet neighborhood, and a picture of an office park with, with buildings. And I write underneath, safe for neighborhoods, safe for business. Because that's, in fact, what the whole thing means. Now, if you have the other situation where you don't have data, you can have a real problem. I'm going to tell you a really wild story, but this really happened. So you were interviewing me one time on a podcast and a, and a one engine, not one engine, one uh, station um, fire department in the uh, Orthodox section of New York, Orthodox Jewish section of New York City. Mm. The guy sends me an email and I must have said something like, I, in Hebrew, I said, in Israel, you know, they have the term aim bara, which means no choice. And I said, no choice means in the fire service, we have no choice but to be excellent. We have no choice but to do a good job. Aim bara. Well, he, bara. he picked it up. He goes, oh, my God, the guy speaks Hebrew, right? So he, 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 he gets a hold of me and he goes, hey, would you talk to me about data? Would you talk to me about data? Because we're protecting these Orthodox people, and I'm not sure how to do it because they don't watch TV. They don't watch any, they don't have any connection with things that are going to give them the data. And I'm trying to tell him what he needs to be doing, and he, he can't do it because he, mm. he doesn't have a way to get it. I, and so he starts telling me how, oh, he says, look, look, we just had a fire the other night in a pizza oven, and here's my report, and it, uh, would not, isn't this great? I'm, I'm the, I'm the, department PIO. And I said, yeah, this is great. But how are you going to find out where there are other pizza places that are kind of you got you got to have the data to do it. And so he says, well, 
Whenever we have a fire, all of our citizens come to the fire because that's kind of, I don't want to say that's their entertainment, but that's when they all get together. Can you imagine? Mm. So I said, well, then you have to start asking them. You're going to have to start asking them about certain things. You're going to have to go into their homes and ask them what's going on. You're going to have to do inspections. No data. You're going to keep having those fires. That's a problem. So Ben, you just gave two examples of, because I think we're both passionate about the role data plays, but getting the data in, you know, and we're going to talk about that in a second, getting the data in using that data internally, but both those examples, you just explained the value of sharing that data and using that data to tell a department story. That's a big deal. Yes. It's a big deal. If you don't have it, you won't be in business. It's the same, it's the same deal. Um, what I've taught if data and its use is every bit a marketing tool as anything else. Because if you can't, if you can't justify, not just justify, the idea, the, the days of justifying, I mean, yeah, you got to be able to do that. But if you start looking at the future, you may not need to buy that quint. You may be able to do something different. If you can go back to the city fathers and mothers and say, you know what, here, based on our data, we feel that we can do a better job in terms of prevention and inspection over here without having to build another station over here, whatever it might be. And then, you know, then the guys and girls might go, oh, no, you can't do that. We don't have a station. We don't blah, blah, blah. You know, you have to really take a look and say, what is the value equation for what it is we're doing? And the data will tell you what it is. It's you almost have to start. <clears throat> I call it strategic thinking. I'm going to give you an example of it. Okay. You both know a guy named Tony McGurk, who was a fire yeah. chief in Merseyside, England which is the largest uh, suburb of Liverpool. Now he, this was, I don't know now, maybe in the early nineties, I think it was. And we all, and we also know he was a commander of the British empire for what he did. Mm. <clears throat> so he found out that he was getting these um, uh, automatic alarms going off. Boom, 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 boom. Every night he'd have to send a contingent of, you know, appliances as they call them in England <clears throat> to, to, you know, and, and 95%, more than 98% of the time, no fire. So you have to send them all back. That costs a lot of money, a lot of pounds, right? So he started to think about this. And he says, I know what I'm going to do. I am going to get a BMW bike. And I am going to outfit this bike with all kinds of things to stop up the sprinklers and, you know, from going. And I'm going to send one firefighter out on that bike when I get a, 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 when I get a call for a building for sprinklers and see what happens. He saved so much money by doing that that there was a there was a, a article in the in the London newspaper that said Tony McGurk makes more money than the prime minister. I didn't, no, no <laughs> lie, it's the truth. Because he was able to, and they paid him for it because he was able to do this. He started the term, in my opinion, even though some will dispute it, community risk reduction. He started that idea where he sent people into the homes. He had, he, I think he had something like 15 kinds of ethnicities where he was and not, and in the poorest sections, what he did was he took, he swore, he brought in civilians. He put them in uniforms from uh, Indians to Arabs, to any other kind, Italians, you name it, and sent them into and do in, to do inspections. Mm. And what he found was, you want to talk about data. What he found was not just fire issues. He found drug issues. He found broken homes. He found young boys who had obesity problems because they were eating everything that was bad for them because they had no fathers. So he put together a way where the kids could work with a firefighter, you know, to have like a big brother to help them out. That's a whole other deal. That's a whole social thing. It's time, I think it's time to get the Chief McGurk onto the podcast here. <laughs> he's, well, you know, he's, well, he, he's, 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 uh, <clears throat> He's like me. He can go as long as you want. You, know? uh, you guys are just your passion and your, your, your breadth of knowledge is just, is just fantastic. And what a, what a great example. Uh, so, okay. Now shifting gears just a little bit, we've got from the chief officer to the probationary firefighter, you know, what, how, how what would you say? And again, it's even, I think the chief officers for the most part get this, but how do you, how do you communicate to the new firefighter that's very action oriented, hands on, mm -hmm. wants to get it done, wants to serve? How do you convey to them their role 
in contributing to high quality data within the, within their organization. I like to say that, you know, it's not in our job description, but from the time we get hired onto the fire department, as we proceed through the ranks, we're data managers at some level. It just That's happens right. that the chief officer is almost exclusively data management. Yeah. But what, what do you say to those, the, new, the newer firefighters um, whether they're tech savvy or not. And again, this generation, the newer generation, the younger generation, and again, not all, but they're typically more tech savvy, but you, you might get those that aren't right. And so regardless of their level of technical expertise, when it comes to computers and technology, what would you advise a newer firefighter, regardless of age about their role in contributing to the quality and consistency of data in their organization? Okay, it's a great question. <clears throat> um, I go right back. <laughs> this is gonna, you're gonna go, oh God, here he goes again. I will just go <laughs> back to tell you, I'll take it right back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the answer and I'm gonna give you an example. Okay, great, great. <clears throat> so when I, okay, so when I went to rookie school, I had everything going against me. I didn't know math, I was scared of heights. I had people saying, you know, you really sure you want to do this because you have no sense of direction. So if you ever have to find, you know, drive the equipment, you'll, you won't get to the fire, you know? And I mean, and I'm like, oh, well, uh, I guess I better learn how to do that. Right. So I remember going out on an aerial, I tell the guys, could you take the aerial truck out tonight? I, I'm scared of heights and I got to figure out how to get up this thing. And they go, okay, May, where we go? Six feet, six feet. Six feet more, six feet more. So one day, you know, they raise the arrow 100 feet. It's like, shh, you know, in the air like that. I got all my stuff on. I got the big hook on it. You know, I go up to the top and I go back down and the training officer whispers in my ear, May, yes, sir. How bad you want to be a firefighter? Really bad. Get your butt back up that ladder twice as fast or you'll never be a firefighter. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. And so... So you have to learn the basic stuff if you want to get in in the first place. So that's the first thing. You need to learn it. But it goes back to something before that. And it comes back. It's very simple. You talked about servant leader, all those kinds of things. Who are you? Who are you? What do I need to know about you that will make you a contributor to this department? Because if you're going to be a firefighter, you're going to do the things that are required of a firefighter. Since you're young and you're part of a particular generation that, at least from what I understand, is brought up with this stuff, maybe you know how to do it. Maybe we can learn some things from you that you can make a contribution. But the bottom line is this. You're going to wear that badge and everything and anything that has to do with being a firefighter. That's what you signed on for. You took an oath and you're going to understand how to do it. And I know you're going to do it because you wouldn't have gotten this far without doing it. And everyone that comes into this department or this service is a leader. We look at them as a leader from day one. It's not like, oh, well, I'll just go this far. I'll be a finance guy, but I won't go, you know, because I'm, I'm into finance or I'm into marketing. No, no, no. You're a firefighter. You're into everything. Yeah, you may go into some particular time of kind of specialty later, but this, the whole deal, this is the only, well, I shouldn't say the only, this is one of the few professions that still goes back. When you call, we come, whatever it might be. And it also means that when the officer says, Hey, I need you to do this, or will you do this? You're jumping right up there and going, yes, sir, I am. Or yes, ma'am, I am going to do this. I'm going to learn it. And you will learn it because you'll want to do it badly enough that you'll get it. I mean, that's, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times, not just with a fire service, or at Disney, where I just thought, I just, I had, we put together a big experience dedicated to the fire department. I think you know about that. It was called Where's the Fire? It was this huge, big experience. It was a multi-million dollar deal. We got Liberty Mutual to, you know, uh, spend the dollars to do it and everything. And one of our Imagineers showed me how this was going to be done. And I looked at him and I said, I, I don't know how we're going to do that because that looks impossible. <laughs> His name is Eric Goodman. God bless him. And he said, Ben, at Disney, we start from impossible and we go from there. And <laughs> it's because we are going to do it. They paid us the money and we're going to do it. And so we it's, don't a, so it's, an expect, it's an expectation, right? It's an expectation just like you have to get on your SCB in so many seconds. Effect, you know, properly, and yeah. you have we have response times, 
that we need to meet, that there's an expectation through our standards of cover. So too, there's an expectation that when it comes to documenting your day, regardless of what you're doing, whether it's training, running calls, um, going to do a community event, that, that documentation as an organization has set forth those expectations to document it, it, the why behind it is it's going to help preserve not only our standing in the community as a trusted brand, of course, as you would say, but also our ability to continue to maintain that level because it takes funding to do that. And part of telling that story um, is going to secure, effectively telling the story is going to secure your job, that, fund, that funding in your job, right? And so- yeah. Basically, it's it's a it's a non-negotiable part of the job that putting effective data into whatever system you're using. We hope it's first due. Um, I'll just say that, <laughs> and uh, and that you're doing it well and consistently, so that you have a story to tell that allows you to perpetuate the good work that you're doing in your community. Would That's that right. be true? Would that be true? That, that would be true. And uh, here's the, here's another thing. Sometimes, um, you know, I. I can, I mean, here's a a story. So um, when I got to the Walt Disney Company, you know, I was in a particular area. They were great. They said, well, Ben, you know, you seem to do this well or that well or whatever it might be. And uh, so I I could, I did pretty well, you know, bringing in business and growing the brand and growing the company and putting up these alliances together, as they were called. And I noticed about halfway into my tenure there, you know, I got promoted once. It's like, hmm. I don't seem to be going anywhere here. I mean, I'm, I'm loving the job. I really didn't care to tell you the truth, but I thought, yeah. So I go to my boss and I said, Hey, what's the deal? You know, and he goes, I said, I'm getting, I'm getting like, we only had three um, ranks. <laughs> you're either really, really good or you're not very good and something in between. And I got number ones, you know, the whole thing, you know, I said, I got these number ones here. And they go, yeah, well, see, here's the thing, Ben. Um, contracts and finance, you know, that seems to be kind of one of your weak, weak areas. And you're, you're bringing in the money and everything and you're creating the alliances. But this, you know, if you want to get promoted again, you're going to have to get your arms around this. And so my typical answer in the past would have been, I don't do that. Mm. You know, I'm bringing in the money. Can't you get someone to help me do that? And I thought, no, it's like, if you ever read the book, whatever got me here won't get me there, you know? So I said, okay, okay, I think I better figure this out. Well, guess what? It wasn't that hard. You know, I did figure it out. I did get promoted. And it was just like, I had this thing, you know, like, oh, I don't do that. I don't do that. I can't do it. I don't know how. If you signed on for this job and you want to progress, you probably better figure out how to do it. There's very little we can't do. We think we can't do it, Hmm. you know, but we can. Have you ever heard the term famous rabbi? Baal Shem Tov, he said, if you have to fall, fall, but who you become will catch you. And oh. what you end up, you know, you say, oh, I can't do it. I'm not going to make it. Yes, you are. You'll make it. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to do it because you'll want to be a part of the fire service so badly that you will, you, you, you will catapult yourself to do it. And data is absolute. Data is everything. Because if you can, you can, the good news is you can prove all this stuff. It's there. Before we couldn't grab the data. It was, you know, you, we didn't have ways to get it. So it's almost anything you can think of, you can be able to put it together and make it happen. You can come up with new creative ideas with data. It's not just some old, oh, it's just numbers type stuff. No, 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 no. You can create jobs with data. You can protect citizens. You can show them where they need to be. You can save money for the department. You can make money for the department, all with data. Ben, I can't think of a better way to end today's podcast. That's good. That's uh, inspiring. And I love the examples that you shared with us. Um, very vivid examples. I think that's um, that helps helps tell the story because it can be so clinical nowadays, um, especially with data, right? But there's stories behind all of this. There's a, you know, it's, it's uh, Chief Brunacini and I collaborated. I mean, I'm blessed to have said to be able to even say this. But he did a presentation um, in, a, in one of my uh, prior lives um, with me, and it's about data drives the fire service, but it's humans in the driver's seat. And I that's think what, what you illustrated today um, nailed it. And that's, you know, that's um, a testament to you, your contribution and ongoing contribution to our community. And 
I'm just grateful to have you on our podcast today. And I know our paths will cross again real soon. I'm grateful too, Tom, to you. I really do appreciate it. It was a great opportunity. Uh, um, the honor is mine, Ben. So thank you. And um, I look forward to talking with you again in the future. You bet. All right.